Dr. Shaw, I hear you teach a graduate school class on data-driven medicine. Can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. So uh, the idea for the class started in uh, 2011, and uh, when I joined the faculty, uh, there was an incentive around teaching students how to make sense of large amounts of data. And we've all heard about EHR adoption and meaningful use and things like that. But there's very few coursework, actually almost no classes that tell stu teach students that once you have the data in electronic form, what do you do with it? So I designed the class in order to cover the, the key concepts around computing with unstructured information because a lot of the data in the EHR is, you know, 80, 90 percent of it is unstructured. And unless you can dip into that, it's just like working with claims or administrative data. And so a, a, a decent part of the class is devoted to processing the unstructured data, extracting uh, medically relevant features, and then doing things with it. And those things would be around predicting risk of adverse events, predicting readmissions, learning new medicine directly from the collective practice of uh, clinicians as recorded in the electronic health record. Hmm. So pretend I'm a student in your class and walk me through in a ba very basic sense of how I would go about doing that. So what we would start out with is a survey of the medical data miners toolkit. So we'll, we would cover things like logistic regression, uh, classification and regression trees, and the basic concepts around how do you take an individual on whom you have, say, 50 observations, and then you have an outcome of interest, as in, did they have heart failure or did they not have heart failure? And then what are the mathematical procedures you can do in order to find what are the variables that are significantly associated with the outcome? That's sort of the general theme of the whole class. And then there's a module around uh, methods in text mining so that you can take a note written by a doctor and find things, drugs, diseases, procedures, devices, that are mentioned in the present positive sense as applicable to the patient. Because then you can figure out that this particular individual had diabetes or had rheumatoid arthritis, then took this drug, and then something else happened. And so using data derived from the unstructured documents, the first application we do is drug safety. And so to give you an example, people with rheumatoid arthritis given Vioxx and then having their first ever heart attack. Turns out if we just look for this pattern, we can find the association between Vioxx and heart attack two years before the recall. Wow. And students actually go through doing these as homework. And then the last module focuses on <coughs> learning new medicine. So a pediatrician I work with had the question that kids with juvenile idiopathic arthritis are at risk of uveitis. And there's four known risk factors for that. The question was, are allergies predisposing to uveitis? Now, it's very hard to do a clinical trial when, because the prevalence of this particular condition is pretty low. But if we go through the EHR, we were able to determine that the rate at which kids with juvenile arthritis who got uveitis, the rate at which they had allergies and allergy medications was 2.5-fold higher. So it's an association. It's not right. proof. But at every doctor visit, we ask people, do you have allergies? And if they mark yes, then that's an indication that you should schedule their eye appointment instead of trying to schedule it for everybody. I see. So it works for screening, and it you know, doesn't even require FDA approval. The intervention is calendaring. And so these are trends that we can pick up, patterns we pick up from the data, the collective practice of multiple doctors. I see. So you're picking up these patterns in patient characteristics that they might not even know have that association. Correct. Got it. And do the patients know that they're participating in research or any sort of studies of that type? So this is all de-identified data. Uh, when you come to Stanford Hospital, you do consent for use of your data for medical education. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, umbrella under which we operate. Uh, we don't have patient names, addresses, or phone numbers, so it's all de-identified. We can't go back to them. Uh, but that's the trade-off in order to be able to analyze the data without needing to go for an IRB consent at every point in time. And so in the future, if you find and you're able to do this with enough associations, you can take a patient's data, look at it, and say, if you have this, you might also be allergic to this or have this adverse outcome. Uh, pretty much. So the idea is, think of it as patients like mine. Let's say you're a practicing clinician. The number of times that when a patient is in front of you and the number of times that you will have an RCT-based guideline to base your decision on will be small. 
because RCTs are done in a very controlled setting. Randomized very, controlled yeah, trials. Yeah, randomized controlled trials. Uh, testing for the efficacy of a single intervention in a very defined population. In real life, people have multiple conditions. They're taking right. multiple drugs. And so you'll have to reconcile three, four, maybe five RCTs worth of data, if it exists, to make your best judgment. But we'll store that in the EHR. And once it's stored, it's not accessible to your colleagues. So the idea is that once you have a patient in front of you, if, you can, if we can find patients like mine, 5,000 similar patients to the one in front of you, we can learn from their collective experience and have decision support that is not trying to outsmart you in terms of the diagnosis, but actually helps you in deciding intervention A versus B, which one is better for this patient. Right. I think physicians would be happy to have that. Absolutely. So clinical decision support so far tries to outsmart a highly educated individual who doesn't want the support. Exactly. It's a complete waste of time. Right. Whether support is needed is for deciding what intervention is optimal for my patient. And that's where, you're right, I mean, physicians will probably welcome the support instead of having an annoying pop-up saying, here are the four differential diagnoses. I mean, I would be looking forward to having that tool when I'm a resident next year. <laughs> Hopefully. So we just spun off a company from, uh, from Stanford, uh, which, is, which is trying to get this idea of building sets of similar patients and bringing them at the bedside, at point of care. So you probably heard about up to date. Right. Where it's, it's, a, it's, a sum, it's a summary of all the published evidence written by another doctor. Right. Think of up to data, where it is the summary of the collective practice of your colleagues and what happened to similar patients. And we'll see what happens. Uh, it's been around for about nine months. So. That's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Shah. It was a thank pleasure. You.